Today's episode is brought to you by Pet Angel Adoption and Rescue. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Call of Leadership podcast, where we interview people from our Michigan community who answered the call of leadership. We will hear their powerful stories and get their advice. Today's guest was literally born into the wine business. He's got over 20 years of experience in winemaking, and he has left his indelible mark on the Old Mission Peninsula winemaking of Traverse City. He's the winemaker at the Old Mission Marie Vineyards, and he's the co-owner of Chateau Grand Traverse. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Sean O'Keefe. Sean, how are you? Great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're from, where you grew up? So my father moved the whole family um, in the early 70s up to Northern Michigan to start a little project on the side of what he was, all the other projects he's been doing to start uh, a vineyard up on Old Mission Peninsula that no one had ever grown grapes before, let alone the Nifra, that is the European grape varieties in that part of Michigan. So I pretty much grew, I mean, I was born in Detroit, although my father claims that I was, probably was conceived in East Bay of Grand Traverse Bay. That might be a little too much information, but uh, I've been there for my whole life. So my, my parents, my father, I wouldn't say classic entrepreneur, because it sounds like there's a lot of them. I mean, he's one of those people that did a lot of very different things. He became fascinated by winemaking when he was importing wine in the 60s, in the early 70s. And he fell in contact with a lot of interesting characters, you know, uh, whether it be the, especially German winemakers for some reason, from like Kohl Ruprecht and Hans Long from the Rheingau and people like this. And he became fascinated with winemaking. And when it came to a point, he tried to buy a vineyard in a place called Kallstadt in the Rheinfels. And it didn't work out. They didn't want to sell their vineyard to a crazy Irishman from America. And so he felt that we had a vacation home up in Traverse City, and it looked a lot like Germany, and it looked a lot like the Rhine. I don't see it, but he saw it at the time. And he brought experts in from the wine schools in, in Germany, Geisenheim. Dr. Uh, Helmut Becker, who I consider like the Johnny Appleseed of Riesling around the, the world. And they brought in the, the Chelichev uh, father and son, Dimitri, or, and, or Andre and Dimitri, and people from University of California, Fresno, and, and a lot of really people that should know things. And all they said was it might work. <laughs> and so all it took, though, was uh, some of his um, friends at uh, Michigan State University to say that it probably won't work with the grapes that you're considering. And once he heard that, it, it pretty much gave him the impetus to basically plant 50 acres where no one had ever done it before. Uh, up at that point, the only people that had really done anything, actually the only person was Dr. Frank in the Finger Lakes, who was a friend of my dad's. And uh, my dad was also friends with uh, Herman Beamer and actually his father, the Alta Beamer. And so we were really, uh, my father was really cognizant of what was going on in the Finger Lakes. And he, he felt that between what the Finger Lakes was doing and what he saw in Germany, that it was possible where we were in Traverse City, where we had a vacation home because they grew so many uh, fruit trees, whether it be... Now it's mostly known for cherries, but we had peaches and other things, you know, before the world market kind of changed how people planted things. And that indicated to him that our climate was mild enough that it could handle cool climate, grape varieties. And he was a, because of this context of the Germans, loved the Riesling. And he felt this would be a perfect place to do it. So he moved the whole family up there. I was born up there. I grew up with it. I considered it just kind of glorified farming. I never really took much interest in it until I became a little older and uh, then it became very fascinating. So what was it specifically about winemaking that drew you into it? Well, if you, you talk to a lot of different people in the wine world, especially in, in North America where we don't have multiple, you know, like generations going back, usually people come from other industries or they're usually trying to, they're, they're pioneering types in a world that has very little to pioneer anymore. And so the idea, um, my father loved wine. He loved the idea of giving a sense of place to things. And that kind of grew in me. I was a literature major when I went to the University of Michigan. I studied German and Russian literature. And maybe I read too much Tolstoy or whatnot, but the idea of going back to my uh, where I grew up and to be able to, to choose one piece of land out of all the, the, the millions of uh, hectares across the world and try to spend my time to make that a better place and to make some a product or something that would speak to our region 
was very evocative and very interesting idea to me. I'm not a artist in the sense of drawing or painting, but I felt that this is a good way to be able to take everything I learned and 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 take some of the the luck and 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 chance that my father well, my father started and turn into something really cool and be able to, to give our beautiful region uh, a little bit more of a, a little more nuance, a little bit more more uh, of a story that it wasn't there yet. I want to go back to something that you mentioned before, and that is that not all grape varietals can grow in all kinds of climates. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, the, the grapes that we know and love today, the grape varieties are ones that are, have been bred for either the Mediterranean region, you know, a surrounding Mediterranean or from core subalpine areas in central Europe or, or the river areas of France and, and Germany and whatnot. And people have developed these grape varieties for the, their cli- their specific climate. When the settlers came over here, they, I mean, this place was called Vineland by Leif Erikson. So, I mean, there was, if you walk anywhere in Michigan or, or gosh, anywhere in the United States, Texas or whatnot, you're going to see grape vines growing all over the place. They're, they're, but these are a different kind of uh, species than the ones that we're, that we love to make classic wine with. So, they brought the European varieties over here, and they didn't last long. There, there were diseases that were powder mildew, downy mildew, a root, a root valve called phylloxera that were indigenous in North America that soon made their way all across the world. And we're dealing with that today with other things right now, for you know, our, you know Dutch home disease and other things. But that happened back in the day, and it pretty much European varieties wouldn't survive here very well because they weren't uh, adapted to the pests here. And they developed ways to get around that. One of the ways was to crossbreed them with the grape varieties that were growing here already, the um, North American species, and create hybrids. And these were, these tended to be more, they were able to resist to the pests and diseases of this country and also of uh, the cold temperatures and things like that. The problem is that the Europeans had d- developed these other varieties for taste over hundreds, if not thousands of years to get specific flavors and tastes that became part of our history and part of what the art of winemaking is. I'm not saying that hybrids can't make uh, beautiful wines, but they aren't part of a very, of a, a century old narrative. And they're, they're very different flavors than what um, these um, European varieties are. My father, uh, who was an importer of wine, was very adamant that he, he couldn't plant European vinifera as opposed to the North American uh, uh, varieties or the, uh, the hybrids. He didn't want to plant anything at all. And so the big question here in Traverse City and Old Mission Peninsula was our limiting factor, and all great regions have limiting factors, ours was the cold winter temperatures because unlike Europe, we're in the 45th parallel, and you'll hear a lot of wineries in our region talk about how we're in the same parallel as, you know, where the sunlight hits on the earth, as the Willamette Valley in Oregon, as Bordeaux, as Piemonte. But they forget that salsa goes from Mongolia and Uzbekistan, some really cold areas. Right. And so I'd as, as say Traverse City, because we're we're on the, the if you if you picture Michigan like a hand, we're on the pink. You know, uh, let's say you're you're looking at your your right hand right in front of you. It looks like you know you see like a glove, and up on the pinky is where Traverse City is in the 45th parallel. Now, if we were over in Europe with a nice warm Gulf Stream warms everything up, we'd be fine. But we have Canada above us, big cold you know, continental rock up there. And so we're kind of um, a very unique region in the world in the sense that we have a maritime climate, like that I wouldn't say what the Mediterranean enjoys, but any area that's near water, but we're also right on the edge of a very cold continental climate that has extremes of heat and cold. And because we're a narrow peninsula between two deep glacially dug bays right next to Lake Michigan with Lake Superior above us, that kind of buffers our region to give us enough it takes the edges off the winter and the edges off the summer and allows us to grow grapes, but only a very limited area. Now, when my father first planted the varieties there, there were basically, it was unanimous that this wouldn't work. Not in the sense that some vines wouldn't survive, but it wasn't a good commercial proposition because either you had to make cheap wine or in wine you could grow a lot of tonnage off or else you have to grow a charge too much and it wouldn't, no one would buy it. My father didn't buy that argument and everybody seems to be an agreement now that they always knew this would work, but it was not the case for most of the 70s, 80s, and almost up to the mid-90s where people accepted that the European vinifera grapes would grow well 
in our region. And that was, uh, I would say I'd lay a lot of that to my, my father's uh, persistence and, and, and stubbornness, honestly. Now, when you talk about how it's going to take so long to, you know, be able to see if you're right or not, is it just because of the fact that if you are trying to grow new grapes, that it just takes seasons or two in order for the grapes to really mature? Is that how long it takes for the wines that, to sit in the bottle before they can uh, develop a, a really nice profile? Well, I, I crafted 12 uh, years out of, uh, of, of beer, but I thought about this for a while. Let's say I've already done all my research and I'm doing it on the spot. So I think that a new grape variety, let's say I pick one from an obscure area in uh, Northern Italy or Switzerland. The reason I think it can grow in our area is because these grape varieties grow in a cold area, like in like mountainous areas where they get really cold temperatures. So it might mean that it will mean that it can survive our winter. I somehow figure out how to get these grape varieties here because not all of them are here. Some are, are you have to go through quarantines and you have to get them established. So if I have to do that process, that's going to take about four to six years right there. But let's say they're already here in the country and I managed to find some you know, genetic material that I can graft the vines, plant them in a vineyard. If I'm doing due diligence, I want to make a great wine. I need to prepare the land for at least two years. And if I was like thinking really for the future, I'd prepare it for four or five years. We're tilling the grapes, the, the land up, planting cover crops, the other things. Because once you put the grapes in, they might be there for 80 years if you're lucky. So but let's say we even did that. We were lucky. We got a perfect land. We got the grape uh, material. We plant it. We wait about three years to four years before we even get a crop from it. But vines are funny in that way where they have very shallow root systems to begin with, but they get more and more established root systems. And that helps them withstand some of the drought, some of the, 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 the vagaries of climate, which we have plenty in abundance in, the, in, the, in northern Michigan. And it's really about somewhere between about 10 to 12 years where a, a grapevine matures enough that it's something that you can make some of the best wines possible out of it. I mean, there's always moments in the beginning, but... And so if I have a really good idea about a grapevine, uh, it might take me anywhere. And then, then the wines have to be made and aged. And some of the red wines, for example, might take you know six to eight years before you know if that's going to be a really superior wine. Now, if you're talking about crass commercialism and all that, yeah, there's, there's a lot quicker ways to go into it. Like, this is, do, this is wine's popular. Let's do this. Let's get in the ground. Let's buy some from over here. Let's blend it in. I'm talking about establishing a wine region for over, you know, a generational type thing. And that's about 15 years. And it's, it's why winemakers are very different from beer makers. A, a beer maker makes a batch and like, hey, let's throw a, a cherry pie or a pig's head in there because, you know, it might make it interesting. If it messes up, then I'll make another one. No, I, I'm sure they're not throwing batches out. But for us, we bring, we plant a, a piece of land at a Extreme cost because Northern Michigan's not cheap. It's everybody wants to build their vacation homes there, and we're competing for the same land. And so we have a very high expensive crop, and we we are inherently conservative uh, because we want to just taste the region where we're from. We don't want to add anything. We don't want to do any little tricks. And we have all of the grapes come in within like usually about a two and a half, to maybe maximum five week long harvest period. And I call it almost triage. You're all coming in at once. We got to make decisions about the wine that will affect it more than anything else we do later in its life. And as a result, we don't get a little like, hey, let's just kind of um, do this or that or this. We're very conservative because we want to um, get every little bit we can. And, you know, I'm turning 50 this year. And so I've been making wine since 1998. So I've had, you know, what's that, 22 years of being in, in, in charge of the wine I make. I probably have about another 15, you know, maybe. It's not that many times. It's like, uh, you know, maybe about 30 times in your lifetime to be in charge and, and make these calls. And as a result, we want to get it right, but we also aren't going to um, uh, throw cherry pies and, and uh, ginseng and, and the weird things in it like some of the um, modern um, beer-making novelties are going on right now. And that mean that the beer guys aren't the buzz. I love beautiful beer, but um, that's just the thing that came to my head right now. Most people think of wine, they, they think of wine that's either from France or maybe even California. And for some reason, your father zoomed in on Germany. Why, why did he pick German? Uh, my father uh, was in France after World War II. He was part, you know, he was an army colonel. And he was helping 
get all the troops back to the United States. He didn't see any active combat or anything like that. But he fell in love with French wines, specifically uh, wines from the Loire and Burgundy and, and the places where, you know, are, are very well recognized in this country as you could, we always look to the French for guidance on wine. And, and, they, and I understand why. But through that, he also, it's, not, it's only a short jump uh, over into the Mosul region in Germany or across the Rhine River from Elsass in France over to the, uh, the Pauls in Baden in Germany. And he made that jump pretty easily and through that met a lot of winemakers and also fell in with um, a very famous wine professor, uh, at least in my little world, uh, Dr. Helmut Becker, who I liken to, a, like I mentioned, I like to mention, almost a Johnny Appleseed of Riesling. I mean, the reason there's Riesling in the uh, British Columbia, New Zealand, and Australia and other things, uh, maybe not Australia, but is is because of, of Dr. Becker. And my dad just got along with these people and he liked he, the German wine country is very different from the beer country down by Munich or the, the, the seat of government in Berlin and other things like that. And he just, he felt a real rapport with these um, super educated farmers, you know, uh, that were doing their thing. And um, he loved the wines, you know, in the early seventies, you know, the late sixties, early seventies, the wines of Germany were at a very, um, were very well esteemed, but they were on their decline in our country because that's where most people first try their first wines. It's either like Lancers from uh, Portugal or wherever that was from, and then like Blue Nun and Black Tower and things like this. And these wines weren't bad wines, but they, they were not great wines because they, were they weren't even made from Riesling and things that Germany's really famous for. They were just basically mass production wines. I guess it'd be the equivalent of a White Claw today or something. But. So my father loved these wines, and he totally committed to Riesling because he considered it the most noble white variety on the planet. And that wasn't a very absurd proposition back then. But going into the 70s, people started to become more sophisticated in their minds and started turning to Bordeaux and, and, and the red wines of France. Then later came the wave of California where if you could spend as much money on a bottle of Cabernet um, from a specific producer, that was the important thing, not whether the wine was unique or came and was speaking to its land and all that. Luckily, we're at a time right now where people always try to scapegoat or get mad about millennials or hipsters or things like that. But I do have to admit that these people, whether they're a certain age or a certain mindset, are so much more open-minded almost to a fault. But the wines of Austria, the wines of Greece, the wines of Michigan, the wines of the Finger Lakes, the wines of British Columbia, these are wines that weren't didn't, weren't marketable uh, when I first got into business here very easily. And now people are completely intrigued. The wines of Hungary, the wines of Georgia, not the state, but the country, but who knows, made the state of Georgia too, you know, and it's interesting to be in these times because people are ready to uh, give them their fair shake. Did you study viniculture in college or is this something that you learned through working the, working at the, the, the family vineyard? No, I gravitated slowly into it. I, um, I studied German, well, they don't have a German literature degree, but I studied, uh, my degree was in German at, at um, University of Michigan. And I just kind of took, it was what I had the most credits in the time. So that's what I called my degree. But I also studied a little, you know, chemistry and other things because I kind of had a, I was trying to fill in all my education I didn't get during high school. And uh, I wanted to be a well-rounded person. I didn't know what I was going to do with my degree, whether I go to law school or do something, you know, on the next level. But I realized I, I study a lot of German and the funny thing about it is that in the United States you can study a lot of German and still not be fluent in it. So I felt like I had to go over to Europe and look, you know, because of my family's contacts, our first winemaker, uh, one of our first winemakers from Chateau Grand Travers, Roland Flager, had moved back to his family's winery in, in Germany. So I went there to apprentice and I actually went through the old fashioned apprentice journeyman system in Germany. And I didn't, uh, at that point, I didn't even know how to wind up a hose. I mean, I was a total egghead and people were just rolling their eyes at me, but I'm fairly intelligent. So I learned pretty quickly. And then I moved on to, there's a winemaking school in Germany. It's a, a university of, it's affiliated with the University of Wiesbaden. It's in the town of Geisenheim. And here is where you study um, biochemistry and you study plant physiology and grafting and things like that. So it's, it's kind of like a graduate level I mean, if I would have gone for the whole program, I would have got an engineering degree in German. Being that I'd already uh, been through the University of Michigan, I didn't want to repeat all the basic courses. So I kind of cherry picked the, the, the last couple of years and spent some time there. 
And what you find from these kind of things, like a lot of people find in universities, is you learn a lot from the constant exposure to the material. And of course, you know, learning biochemistry in German is not fun, but you you learn it. But also the people that help you study and the people you go visit on the weekend at their homes, it's also very traditional to put it, uh, study. I mean, a lot of it's anecdotal, you know. So when you go visit people in the Mosul or you visit some family that has a place in Franken in Germany and you talk to the parents and you look at what the, the son or daughter is doing with their wandering, what they envision, that's where a lot of stuff was learned too. But to be over in a classical culture with that was very appealing to me. You know, and like I mentioned before, you know, I read all these German authors and Tolstoy and Goethe and things like that. And the idea of, um, of, of farming and making art out of wine, it's not such a foreign idea. And it seems to be a fairly common thing now with beer makers and winemakers. But when I was doing, when I was committing to this in the early 90s, it wasn't such as more considered something else. Today's episode is brought to you by Pet Angel Adoption and Rescue. Cats bring all kinds of joy to your life. They make great companions while you read the newspaper or binge watch your favorite television show. If you're thinking about adopting one, then check out Pet Angel Adoption and Rescue. Based in Frankenmuth, Pet Angel Adoption and Rescue is a 501c3 nonprofit no kill cat shelter. Over the last 16 years, they found loving homes for hundreds of homeless kitties. Each cat is fixed, vaccinated, and microchipped before going to their forever home. While waiting for you to adopt one, Pet Angel Adoption and Rescue has a superb all-volunteer staff that loves and cares for each and every cat. To learn how you can support, or even better, adopt one of these cute kitties, visit their website at PetAngelAdoption.com. Once again, that's PetAngelAdoption.com. Their link is in the show notes below. And now, back to the show. You know, you studied uh, winemaking when you were over in... Germany. What drew you back to doing wine in Michigan? There's a, I think it's, it's a quote from James Joyce, I believe, but it goes, I want my gravestone. I went as far as turn back, Um, (laughs) which maybe Ulysses is like that too. But in any case, I came back and I didn't, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, I actually went out to California and I looked at various places out there to go work. And I really had a love for Oregon. I saw a lot of potential there. I'm not talking about the Willamette Valley. That was already well on its way, but I saw some things happening in Omiqua and other unknown areas in the South. I didn't really quite formulate what I wanted to do. So I came back to my family's winery and I, I worked with my dad importing wine and doing a few things. And then I kind of fell into it and I kind of realized, you know, and I kind of knew this from the very beginning is when you when a lot of Americans go over to Europe or overseas, a lot of times they're at least for the first initial period they're like, oh, this is so beautiful and this is so cool because in most cases the architecture is better or the sense of place because it's been winnowed over you know it's been thought and, and over you know millennia, but then if you spend a little more time you start realizing how much you know people really do treasure especially over there, but uh, they always ask you about your home because it's important where you come from. And I realized from all these conversations I have with various Europeans is that I come from a really beautifully, uh, beautiful and unique place. It's not absolutely, it's not really the worst place to go back to a, a peninsula on Lake Michigan, where there's a lot of potential, where the, the cost of entry and starting a business and doing things is not so bad. And it kind of grew on me. So I always had it in the back of my mind. I did, you know, I did scout around in California and Oregon looking at some other possibilities, but it was my home. There's a strong attraction to that to make your home a better place. And our area, Traverse City, people are very, uh, sometimes inordinately, uh, proud of, of what we're doing there. And it was a good place to go back to. Yeah, I agree because Traverse City is definitely one of my favorite spots in Michigan to go and visit. We're, we're up there typically once every three or four months, so... Well, you think about it too, though, is so I moved back in the late 90s, like in 1998, 96, 97, around there. I kind of then I was kind of flirting around looking at Oregon and California, but some of the new wineries started around then. So you started seeing Peninsula Cellars and Black Star Farms, and then a lot of the things in Leo and all, because nothing had happened for a long time. Then came the beer makers, and then came some of the first good restaurants. I remember very well uh, when my, um, you know, my dear friends, the, the Danielsons started Trotteria Stella 
film festival started, and then you know, a decade after that, and then there seemed to be a real Traverse City really started to become not just a point on the map, but someplace where it's a really special place. When you see all that happening, especially you know, going through your late twenties and your thirties, it wasn't the best in the sense that you felt you were kind of missing out from all the people that were living in New York or San Francisco or interesting places like that. But there wasn't like there was a complete lack of cool stuff happening. There's a real sense of like people inventing and, and creating a, a modern version of Traverse City. And I really, that kept me there. And I was part of that. And I, I really, to this day, think that the, the, the wine industry was absolutely key in the very beginning of, of, of starting all that, the sense of place that could stand up to anywhere else in the world. And not saying that this wine is better than your wine from there, but these wines are worth, they speak of this area. This area is beautiful. These wines are beautiful and they have worth. Yeah, I agree, because it seems like whenever you start to see, like in an area, when you start seeing really good crafted wine start to appear, food is always right behind it, because everybody wants to have a great glass of wine with a great meal. Absolutely. And I mean, to me, like when I look at wine lists uh, down in, uh, it's been a key thing with me is, you know, I'm the winemaker at Mari Vineyards right now, and Honestly, we could sell almost all our wine out of our tasting room. And the way the wine business is in the legal system in the United States is that we can make much, much more money by selling it directly out of the winery. But it's always been key for me to have our wines, whether it be Chateau Grand Travers or Mari, or even my, my friends' wines from other wineries. I'll promote anybody because I want to see our local wines on the list of Chicago and Indianapolis and Detroit and Minneapolis and Milwaukee and places like that that are nearby. Because we are the local produce. When people can look, let's say you have a wine from 2015, or let's say let's say 2010, beautifully warm year. And then when it's a hot, warm year, people in Chicago know that, people in Milwaukee know it, and the wines are full and rich, and maybe I mean, a little soft, where you have a cool year, 2000, let's say, I don't know, 2000, well, 2009, where summer never came, or 2019, where summer came late. The wines are a little more edgy, but they have a, a certain more a really kind of prettiness that people were struggling with a, a tough year and did something really cool because they know how to deal with it. Those are fun things when, when food becomes less than just shoveling things in your mouth or pouring things down your gullet, where they have stories that come along with them and you can actually add your own stories to them. I think that's great. Part of it too, though, is if you want to be known, you got to be out, you have to be in New York. You got to be where Michigan people go or people from Michigan, the, the people that come here, like we're Texas or Arizona. And these are important to have, I wouldn't say sell a lot of wine there, but have some key places there where your wines are can be found and people try them for the first time. And that might lead them here to Traverse City to come visit me in person. Because I know you mentioned this before about Amari. What attracted you to start working at Marie Vineyards? Family businesses are interesting. Ours is very, started the first winery up in uh, Northern Michigan. And my father, uh, but especially my brother, had a very clear idea of what they wanted to do. I felt from my experiences in Germany and other places, I had a really definite idea of what I wanted to do. And for you know about 15 years, we were able to coexist with our different visions. But at some point, there's only so much life you have. And I realized I was getting older and I wanted to make the wines I wanted to make. And I was offered an opportunity from a family friend in front of my dad's, uh, Marty Lagana to be the winemaker uh, for, at first, you know, the kind of side project with some of his wines, he was selling most of the grapes to my family, but we always knew that he was going to open his own winery. I was always uh, there to help and consult. And then, you know, to hire the next winemaker. And when it came to it, it came down to who they should hire. I go, you should hire me because I think a lot of our interests align. Marty, uh, his family, you know, uh, comes from the, he, he was born and raised up in Iron Mountain, up in the Upper Peninsula. And but he is from Italian and Croatian extraction. And what's funny is his grandmother, maiden named Mari, used to make hooch and wine and stuff in the basement during prohibition and other times and all that, only for sacramental purposes, I assume. But when you look at these older Italian families, whether it be in Michigan or in California or Oregon or other places, is when several generations down, when somebody does really well, makes money and other things. They remember the good times and that was making wine and making food and other things. And so I thought, you know, he wanted to establish this beautiful winery. And if you ever see our place, it's, it's a place that's going to be there 
for a very, very long time. This was not like a, a, a thing that was built uh, on the cheap. And we've done everything in our possible, not just in the building, but in our agricultural practices with our organics and other things we're doing to try to really raise Michigan to another level and, and to make the absolute best wines that we're able to do in our region with the most personality. And that's very attractive to me. And that's what uh, drew me over. And um, it's tough to leave a family business, but you know, it's, it's one of those things that needed to be done. And I think everybody's better for it. Now, when you started your work at Marie and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like with Marie, they do a lot of work with Italian varietals that are there. So what was, what was the attraction with the working with uh, Italian grapes? Well, I alluded to that before, you know, Marty's family, you know, up in Iron Mountain, I mean, they look back to their, their, their ancestors from Northeastern Italy, I think from the Marche region of Italy and then from Croatia. So to me, maybe because I studied literature or studied other things, first of all, I love Italian wines, but Saying you love Italian wines is like saying, I like Europe or I like South America. There's so many, Italy is almost like the Amazon of wine varieties. I mean, they've been growing grapes there since the time out of mine. So I was very lucky. I, I love Northern Italian grapes and their climates in some of the places do overlap ours enough that we can grow these here. And I like the challenge. And I wanted to do something. I knew that Marty uh, and Olivia and his and Alex, his, his, his son, they wanted to say something about their heritage. So I'm glad and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that a, a big part of the family came from Northeast Italy where we can actually grow the grapes. Because like I mentioned, sometimes if they would have come from Sicily or Sardinia, there's nothing we can do because I can't grow grapes that grow in the Mediterranean. They would die in our climate. But luckily, our region overlaps enough with some of the subalpine areas in Northeast Italy. Um, that we can grow some of these things and it's fun to learn new things and it's fun to adapt some things. And honestly, there's some beautiful, uh, that area of Northeast Italy, where it be up in Trentino, Alto Adige, some people call it Sud-Tirol. even though we're Friuli, at one point, this is all part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and there's a strong Germanic influence. So it's not like I'm going to a whole other region. There's a lot of the same winemaking styles and other things are common with what I learned in Germany. So it wasn't like I was making a big leap to something completely new, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating, you know, and then uh, to be able to, to do something new that no one's done before. Um, yeah. I share that with uh, Marty's idea and all that. I think it's great. And I'm glad to be able to do that. Okay. So, so let me get this straight. So your last name, you're an Irishman, you're fluent in German making Italian wines. Yeah. It sounds kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> the Irish consigliere. I guess that's what I am. Um, God bless America. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got a question for you now. For for people that are thinking that, you know, they want to get in wine, they they maybe want to try, you know, some wines. What would be like maybe one or two key things that you would tell them to 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 maybe look for in a wine if they're if they're if they want to get their feet wet, start getting into wine a little bit. Wine is something you like, uh, like cheeses or other fermented things is it's something that you have to acquire a taste. So some of your initial impressions where I like this or I don't like this shouldn't be most important in the beginning because wine deals with flavors and tastes that are a little more or much more intense than the American cuisine of the last 40 or 50 years. So what I mean by that is sense of sour, sense of astringency. These kind of things um, get really, can be really uh, intense in certain wines. And the wines that don't taste like anything, the wines that just taste like cantaloupe juice or grapefruit might be easy to drink and there's nothing wrong with them. But there's a reason why that's an $8 bottle of wine from New Zealand. They're, they're, they're not interesting. The other thing, the reason why these flavors and people have learned to like these kind of things, just like they do, I wouldn't say stinky cheese, but let's say a pungent cheese, is they do, uh, well, for example, wine, they are meant to be paired with food in some way or another. Of course, there's drinking wines. You know, I have no problem drinking a glass of Beaujolais or a dry recently on its own. But they're, when they're paired with food, some of those like tart flavors from a, a dry style recently or Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Grigio will cut through cream sauces and it will refresh your mouth and, and create a liveliness like biting into a, a fresh apple. 
or a lemon. Why the, the reason why white wine pairs so well with fish is a, it's almost like it acts as the lemon. It creates a, a citric sensation. Red wines with their astringency and their their ability to create texture in the mouth. Well, those can be sometimes too extreme for people who are not used to them. But when you eat uh, with proteins like with meats or, or fats from cheeses or even like mushrooms and other savory things for vegetarians is that red wine then it interacts and you get different flavors in your mouth than what uh, just drinking it on its own. And that's something that takes a long time to develop a, a flavor for, but it's fun. It's fun to learn that stuff, you know, uh, travel helps a lot. So whenever you travel somewhere, drink the wine from that area. I'm not saying, you know, drink, you know, if you're going to North Dakota, this drink North Dakota wine kind of thing. But if you are in Italy or New Zealand or Australia or Germany or, or Southern England with their beautiful sparkling wines or, or things like that, make an effort to, to try the wines from that area. And then after time, it's just like reading books. You kind of you know the authors and you kind of know where they're coming from. And before you know it, you're, you're, you know, more than somebody else, uh, or at least you know enough to guide your own tastes and things. It's fun. It's fun to learn new things. Yeah, I think you hit on a good point there because some of the best wines that I've ever discovered in my life is when I actually took the time and went to the vineyard to a tasting room and just tried them. I mean, it's always relaxed and you get a bunch of different ones that you can try. And and from there, I've discovered some really beautiful some really beautiful wines up, uh, you know, Traverse City way, you know, that's how we found uh, Marie Vineyards and a couple of others that are up there. So I think there's actually something to just going to the vineyard and actually trying it and talk to the people there. Well, part of that would be, though, is, you know, Traverse City is a tourist area. So try um, if you're expecting, you know, um, an hour tasting on July 4th weekend, be aware that it's going to be very busy. To me, it's those kind of off seasons, like right after the kids go back to school in um, September. There's a, a time in uh, early September, all the way up to early October, which I think is the best time to come try wines because the people in the tasting room at that point will they'll have less people. It won't be uh, big throngs, and they will be able to talk to you about the wines. And at least I can't speak for every wine region, but I do know from going to all the tasting rooms in our area that uh, most of the people working there are very passionate about what they're doing there and they learn and they're there to work because they want to learn about wine. And a lot of them are going off to other careers and doing other things. But for that time, you know, whether they're opera singers or, or uh, future business owners or, or future winemakers, and these are people at least I'm thinking of in our, our tasting room, know their stuff and our care. Or else are people that have, have, have traveled the world and now are settling down. And they love the, the chat about wine and the, 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 all the nuances and intricacies that come with it. So if you can find, if you can schedule at the right time, it's great. Now, on, uh, otherwise, wine restaurants, not all of them are the old, like, you know, the, the cliche of the, the maitre d', you know, uh, speaking with a fake French accent and, you know, and, and, and making the wine experience horrible. That doesn't really exist anymore. Most of the, the cool Fun places that have great food have usually people that are young in age or young in mind that are very enthusiastic, but they've done their, uh, there's a whole sommelier culture of people just love the story of wine. They'd love to share their information with you. And then I would say, be a little, live a little dangerously. Try some wines that might be a little bit off the, the beaten path. If you go, I don't like dry wines, then try at least a little drier. If you say you only, uh, I don't like reds or don't like whites. Well, try to identify what it is you like or don't like about the ones you like. And maybe you might find some things in those categories. It's fun because wine makes uh, dinners and foods and, and things so much more pleasurable. And I mean, you can achieve that with beer and mixed drinks to a certain extent, but I just don't think it's the same thing. Of course, I'd say that as a winemaker, but I, I, just, I, I think it's one of those great pleasures of life, like reading a good book or um, enjoying a nice cheese or, or, or other things that you know people should cultivate and learn more about. Yeah, I agree with that. And I cannot argue with you on that. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, cause you talked before about how, especially over 4th of July weekend, a place like your Mari vineyards is absolutely packed. And I know you've referenced him before a couple of times in this interview. The owner of Mari vineyards is Marty Lagina from the history channel. And they have that show, the curse of Oak Island. What impact has his appearance on that show had on the vineyard? I haven't watched the show. I mean, because I work with them, I, 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 I just, I, I just, I kind of keep a distance from it. But 
there's a tremendous interest in that series. And we have many, many people coming through and, and people asking questions and things. And for that, I would say, if you come to the winery, we have this beautiful stone building. And I'm not talking about just like some fake brick place. I mean, these are big hauled in stones. And I mean, you'll see that the, for people who like that show and like some of the, I would say the quirkiness of Marty and his brothers. I mean, it, it's pretty much infused into the construction of the building and the idea of things. All the the, the, the timbers and the all the, and then then the, uh, you just have to see it there. I mean, he collects odd things. He's always been interested in esoterica, which uh, I consider Oak Island is one of those things. And so you'll see it through the winery. Now, if you really want to get the whole experience, I book a tour and actually come down to the wine caves that are down below, and that's not generally open to the public. And there you'll have the, the the time to speak calmly and, and, and long and, and thoughtfully about wine. But then you'll be down in why he built this place because there are parts of the tunnels that um, in our caves that are deep underground because that helps you know keep all the, the, the temperature constant for the barrels. It's a very contemplative place. But he lined up some of these cave tunnels so that they line up with the summer solstice. So every June 20 first through 23rd, depending on when it falls, when the sun is uh, rising up on that morning, when it's the longest day of the year on our where we are, um, the sun rises right up the middle, almost Indiana Jones style. We, we have a big party at 5, 12 in the morning or whatever it is. <laughs> Whether it be that time or another time, you can kind of see where some of that uh, fascination he has with some of the mysteries, both probable and improbable of Oak Island, have worked their way into the winery and the construction and how we do things there. I think that's really cool because to have that sense of zeal and imagination and, and keep that into your adulthood is, is important. And we try to keep that, you know, joy of learning new things and doing new things. And then at the same time, appealing to uh, at least our conceptions of what older traditions are and trying to establish them up in northern Michigan. You'll see it in some of our labels and things too. I kind of play off it a little bit. And I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I love Oak Island and other things, but, um, you know, but I'm not a big Da Vinci Code fan, but I am a fan of uh, the name of the rose, you know, I'm a little more highbrow, you know, wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> some of our labels and things, there's always little subtle nods and things to um, some of the things of history and these, you know, these, these grand ideas that Oak Island sometimes encompasses. So and when it comes down to it, just like my dad, who was such a personality, uh, Marty is one too. And it would take somebody like that to build the winery and, and commit the resources and things to build something that's going to last if you look at the building and look at what we're doing in the vineyards, this is not some flash in the pan thing. This will be around in one form or another for, for a long, long, long time. It, it's, it's, it's great to be part of that. I'm, I'm, I appreciate his zeal. Yeah, he's uh, he definitely seems like they got a bunch of characters on that show. But, you know, it seems to be pretty popular because they always say on TV that uh, it's the number one rated nonfiction show, I think, on cable television or something. So. I would argue the nonfiction part, but that's just me. But, uh, <laughs> I guess it's um, pretty popular in Canada. Little kids and Texans are the number one markets for it. Yeah. And but no, there's seriously, there's a lot of interest in people. Marty is I can't ever guarantee he's going to be there. He pops in, he pops out. I, I don't, I don't ever know he's going to be there. His son Alex is a general manager. He appears in the show too, and he is you know the captain of the ship at our winery. Rick and other people, I, I've rarely seen. I know they've been there, but I, we can't guarantee anybody's going to be there. But you can totally tell that that person designed the place. That's awesome. If people want to connect with you or follow you online, what's what's the best way for them to do that? Well, uh, we have all the social media at marivineyards.com. So you know, you know, you just have to Google Mari Vineyards. If they're interested in hearing my you know long answers to short questions. You know, I have my own handle. It's called Hauptstrasse One Fifty Five at Instagram. That's H A U P T S T R A S S E 155 at Instagram. But the main thing is Mari Vineyards. And there, if you go on our, our main website, marivineyards.com, they'll have the links to the our, our, our other social media where I'll chime in and other people in our, our winemaking family will, occasionally Marty and, and his family. And uh, there's more information there. And another, or just go visit our region and all. The wineries in our region are interlinked in one way or another. People have worked for each other, are friends with each other, in some cases married to each other, or this and that. And it's a very, for however much bigger it's gotten or become in the last couple uh, decades, 
it's still a pretty small family. And so that's a good way to get a sense of the whole place too. And you get a little bit of every winery, every other winery you visit in a way if that makes any sense. Okay. Uh, thank you. And for our audience, we will have those links in the show notes down below. Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast today. Thank you. Hey, everyone, before you go, if you want to get these episodes delivered straight to your inbox, then come over to callofleadership.com and sign up for our free email newsletter that includes all kinds of goodies. I'll catch you in the next episode.